Thank you. I'm going to open up this presentation with a statistic published last year by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Their data analysis reveals that 43% more Americans are living to age 100 today compared to year 2000. This same data analysis showed that starting in year 2008, people who lived to age 100 were dying at a 14% reduced rate. So we have 43% more Americans living to age 100 and fewer of them dying after they reach age 100. Now this is a biomedical advance that was ignored by the mainstream media. As it relates to functionality, let's wind the clock back to 1980. Ronald Reagan running for president. Some of his supporters even felt he might be too old to assume the presidency. There was a lot of concern about that. At 69 years old, people thought that may be too far along for you to be president. Move forward 36 years, an individual 70 years of age runs for president. No one thinks that age is a limiting factor. But if you look back at that election cycle last year, well, their average age was 69. And yet age was not considered a reason for them not to be able to perform their duties. But let's travel back in time 49 years to see what aging looked like in 1968. It wasn't pretty. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as president. Lyndon Johnson, at 59 years of age, had to abdicate from the re-election campaign. He suffered severe coronary atherosclerosis. And back in 1968, there was nothing that they could do to treat it without risking dying on the operating room table. They didn't know what really caused it, so they couldn't really prevent it from getting worse. So at 59, he was all washed up. But you look at what's happened today, this 56% decline in coronary artery disease risk. This was published just three months ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it again was overlooked by the mainstream media. And yet it's earth shattering news. Coronary artery disease is the leading killer. And there's a lot of reasons for this 56% decline in coronary artery disease risk, including a lot of what you all are doing in this audience, because you're proactively taking steps to reduce your risk of suffering a coronary thrombotic heart attack. They didn't know what to do in the 1960s. And if you do develop an occlusion to your coronary artery where they've improved bypass surgery and stinting to the point where you can go into the hospital and have a very good chance of coming out alive. Unfortunately, that technology was not available until very recently. If you look at Lyndon Johnson's medical history, it was horrific. He suffered a heart attack at age 46. They didn't do anything. There was nothing they could do about it. He endured chronic angina pain. At 59 years of age, he was washed up at 64 years dead. Technology did not advance fast enough to save his life. But let's look at the recent presidents that we've had having similar medical issues. Bill Clinton suffered severe coronary atherosclerosis, but technology advanced. They were able to bypass his arteries with surgery and then put a stent in when they reoccluded. George Bush didn't even need to have a heart attack. They diagnosed a 95% occlusion and they were able to put a stent in to reopen that vascular blockage. And the all time king of beneficiaries of medical technology advances. And, and he's written a book about this, Dick Cheney. Every time he had a major event, well, the technology was there to save his life. He's about 77 years of age right now. He wouldn't have lived past 50 if it were not for these advances in biomedical technology. And the fact of the matter is, this is happening before our eyes. A biomedical renaissance happening before our eyes, and yet we're not even recognizing it. This 56% decline in coronary artery disease risk, I want to let people know, well, we had something to do with that. We started publishing a newsletter in 1980 that advocated for using low-dose aspirin to reduce heart attack risk, uh, reducing homocysteine, boosting DHEA, putting in coenzyme Q10 to your supplement program if you had an issue or to prevent an issue from occurring. But more than anything else, 
we encouraged our readers to defy conventional reference ranges. In the early 1980s, if your systolic blood pressure reading was up to 150 or 160, doctors weren't even aggressively treating it. If your fasting glucose was 139 milligrams per deciliter, the doctors weren't telling you you were a diabetic. They thought it was normal because it was normal. And yet we know now that you want your systolic blood pressure to be well under 120. You want your fasting glucose to be under 90. And back in these early days, the medical profession was not on the mark. They were letting their patients die unnecessarily. I contend today that we are further advanced as it relates to reversing human aging than the doctors were who were trying to save people from coronary artery occlusion back in the early 1960s. They were losing a lot of people on the operating room table in the ICU unit or shortly thereafter, the patients were dying on them. As it relates to age reversal technology, a very low risk of complications and a huge reward because we're not talking about just bypassing a blocked artery in the heart. We're talking about inducing significant and systemic biological age reversal with technologies that exist right now. No new drug needs to be discovered. We can implement these as soon as tomorrow if the people want to come forward and take part in this kind of research. A study published in Nature, June 30th, a group of scientists got together and evaluated the mechanisms of aging. And they determined that there is no upper limit threshold as to how long people can live. This is something that we've understood. Yes, we should applaud that. But uh, we've understood that for a long time. Uh, but they've, it's now in a published journal. So if someone tells you that there's a, a, a finite amount of years that a human being can live, at least you can cite a published study in Nature indicating that is not a problem. It's not a problem unless you suffer a condition related to aging. 2,000 people a day suffer a stroke. It's usually caused by a clot that occludes blood flow to a portion of the brain. This happens quite a bit, and there's about three different outcomes that occur after a stroke occurs. Some people are fortunate enough to get good treatment, and they can make it out of the hospital in reasonably good shape. For too many others, permanent paralysis, blindness, cognitive dysfunction, they're institutionalized for the rest of their lives. And others, well, they just wind up in a cemetery. That's it. Acute ischemic stroke kills, it cripples. It's a major, major problem. But guess what? In 1996, the FDA approved a drug called tissue plasminogen activator. It is a clot dissolving drug. If used properly, it can save a lot of these stroke victims from institutionalization or, or the cemetery. It works. But in 2011, a study looked at how many hospitals were using this drug that was FDA approved, only one to three percent. Only one to three percent of the hospitals were using an approved medication to reverse acute ischemic stroke. Now this angered me. I was very upset that there was technology that could reverse acute ischemic stroke and it was not being utilized by the medical establishment. So I wrote an article titled Reversing of Acute Ischemic Stroke. And the technology I focused on was something called an endovascular thrombectomy. This is the mechanical removal of a clot in the brain. And once you remove that clot, hey, the blood starts flowing back in and a person recovers. And I got some support, by the way, from the New England Journal of Medicine because they too understood that this technology was ready to become standard of care, but it wasn't. Hospitals were not incorporating this procedure. A stroke victim would come in and they would just watch them slowly become paralyzed and sometimes die without using an effective therapy. But look at the bottom of that slide. The New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 said that it's effective up to six hours after the onset of stroke symptoms. Well, just three months ago, some pioneering doctors aggressively used this endovascular thrombectomy technique and they were recovering stroke victims 24 hours after onset of stroke symptoms. This is a huge medical advance and again, overlooked by the media. And if you don't know to demand this in the hospital that you're taken to in the event you have stroke symptoms, you could very likely wind up in a nursing home or dead while an existing technology approved by the FDA is not being utilized. Bottom line is doctors are too busy to keep up with all the advancing technology. You have to do that on your own. And the way you do it, by the way, is identify in your geographic location what is the comprehensive stroke center. 
not where is the nearest ER room, you want to know where is the comprehensive stroke center that will utilize the endovascular thrombectomy technique to yank that clot out of an occluded cerebral artery to get you out of that hospital in a functional state as opposed to being taken to a nursing home where you spend the rest of your life. In the event anyone, by the way, suffers any stroke symptoms while you're in San Diego, there are two hospitals that are comprehensive stroke centers. They will aggressively use a thrombectomy device to pull a clot out of your brain and potentially get you back even up to 24 hours after stroke onset. Think of how many people have been literally buried when they could have been recovered with existing technology. It is frightening. Real world example. My father-in-law, age 80, he, he's holding a six-month-old grandson. He was in great shape. He swam laps in his community swimming pool, but he had terrible medical care totally incompetent medical care. This is him two months before his stroke. He spent the next three years in a nursing home. He had another grandson, but he couldn't quite enjoy that grandfather experience when you're half paralyzed, laying in your own waist, cognitively impaired, never quite got to enjoy it because of incompetent medical care. He just didn't know what to do to save his own life. And the bottom line is, we're seeing major advances in conventional medical technology that's being overlooked to the detriment of anybody who suffers a stroke. So you look back just 21 years, 1996, a clot dissolving drug is approved, but it's almost never used. Crazy, never used, almost never, okay? Then thrombectomy starting 2006, that was starting to show efficacy, but again, wasn't being used. It took the New England Journal of Medicine and Life Extension to write editorials saying, hey guys, you've got technology, use it. And then just a couple months ago, they find that the thrombectomy is effective up to 24 hours after a stroke onset. So if you have a loved one that's showing stroke symptoms, and you go to an ER room and they just say, well, there's nothing we can do, you now know what to do. In fact, if that ER room does not have medically competent people, get that person in an ambulance and take them to a hospital that can remove the blood clot. And I contend today, there are more people needlessly dying of aging today than unfortunately are suffering the effects of malpractice as it relates to failing to treat a stroke. In February 2015, we published a special edition of our Life Extension magazine describing a number of age reversal modalities that we felt were ready for clinical testing and or clinical use. We felt that these therapies were safe, they were potentially effective, they, some of them needed some more research to validate them, but we felt it was time to start implementing age reversal technologies. And the area that we're very excited about right now is a drug called rapamycin. And some very smart scientists have been self-experimenting with rapamycin, but they've been getting it wrong. They've just been mistakenly taking the wrong dose. They were taking, let's say, a milligram or two every day for two or three months, and then staying off for two or three months, hoping to get a benefit. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a few slides the proper dose that we think is going to produce enormous benefits. In virtually every species tested, you give them rapamycin, it extends their lifespan, improves cardiac function, reduces cancer risk, it improves health markers across the board. And one month after last year's RADFEST, uh, Science Daily reported on a study in mice in which rapamycin administered for a brief period in middle age extended lifespan rather dramatically. Uh, the CNN picked it up a few months after that, and they found that uh, mice given rapamycin in mid-age a 60% improvement, increase in longevity. So CNN did a report on the idea of giving rapamycin to your pets. Now the mechanisms of action are fascinating. There is a macrolide protein in our cells called mTOR. That's the acronym for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. And for most of us, our mTOR activity is way too high. And when it's too high, well, it causes excess cellular propagation. That might sound good, but it really isn't. Think cancer, think atherosclerosis, think obesity, think a lot of problems that are caused by excessive cellular proliferation, including the accumulation of too many fat stores. But what fascinates us is that when you suppress 
mTOR, you boost a process in the body called autophagy. That is ridding the body of accumulated metabolic waste products. Aubrey de Grey has talked about this for decades, that if we're going to find a cure for aging, well, we need to rid ourselves of the cellular junk, as Aubrey has been quoted as saying many, many times. We need to remove the cellular debris that has accumulated, and when you suppress mTOR, you turn on autophagy, and you can cleanse your cells of these toxic metabolic waste products that are interfering with healthy cellular function. There's numerous benefits that have been shown when you suppress mTOR. Now, almost everyone here is doing it indirectly. When you boost an enzyme called AMPK, when you elevate that enzyme, which you do with metformin, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol, gynostema pentaphylum, there's a number of ways to boost AMPK. You indirectly suppress mTOR. Now, that's very good, but what we like about rapamycin is it directly inactivates the mTOR C1 pathway directly does it in the dose that we're going to recommend. And in doing so, we are hoping to see reductions in inflammation in humans, by the way. Reductions in inflammation, uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, all of the degenerative diseases that we're faced with, we believe can be addressed, or almost all of them, with rapamycin. This is just incredible news. And the idea that we can directly inhibit mTOR in a controlled mechanism can enable us to gain tremendous control over aging right now. We don't have to wait for any new discoveries. This drug sits on your pharmacy shelf, but you don't want to buy it in the United States. Way too expensive. You want to buy it offshore. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Excess mTOR, again, we need mTOR. It's something we don't want to get rid of, but we're over-consuming calories, especially glucose-spiking calories. We're over-consuming proteins high in leucine, and these over-consumptions of foods boost our mTOR, and we unfortunately pay a big price as it relates to our health. Now, when you go back to your room, if you want to type in to PubMed.gov, mTOR and aging, you can stay up all night long reading published studies showing that this is a proven mechanism to slow down, if not reverse, biological aging. You want to turn down mTOR to derive all of these benefits, including reductions in your risk of cancer and reductions in your risks of virtually every age-related disease. Now, you may wonder, what do we have this in our cells for? Why do we have mTOR? Well, we needed it to come into existence. Uh, when we were created, we required rapid cellular proliferation in our mother's womb in order to sustain ourselves. And through the fetal uh, growth period, we needed lots and lots of mTOR all the way up until early adulthood. So we're fully mature, and instead of cutting down on our calories like we should, we sometimes consume more calories. So we've got mTOR revving up at top speed, and we wonder why do we have these problems that almost everyone suffers from when they grow older. One reason is excess mTOR activity. It can be directly suppressed with rapamycin. Study done on an mTOR inhibitor on elderly people, published December 24, 2014. They looked at the immune function of older people given an mTOR inhibitor, and there were reversals of markers of immune senescence. Significant immune restorative benefits in response to rapamycin. So this broad spectrum benefit of rapamycin makes us want to recommend that you consider taking it. This is the new rapamycin protocol that we are going to study, but it's already been incorporated into the clinical practice of a pioneering medical doctor. And he's a great guy from the standpoint that he publishes everything on a website. He open sources it all. So on this uh, slide, there is a website, but you don't have to worry about scribbling this down because my entire presentation will be available on a brand new website I'm going to announce at the end of this talk. So everything you're seeing, you will be able to review at your leisure anytime you want. This medical doctor was over 70. He was feeling very old. He put himself on this dose of rapamycin that we're going to talk about, and he was able to lose five inches off his belly, and he was able to regain his youthful energy. All kind of clinical markers improved in response to using rapamycin, what we believe to be the proper way. What we need to do is validate does rapamycin reverse aging in old people? Need to validate that. So what we're assisting with right now, with money and expertise, is a clinical study on rapamycin. We're going to use doses from 2 milligrams to 5 milligrams just once a week. Just once a week. 
we feel you can get all of the benefits of rapamycin with once a week dosing and not keep it in your body throughout the week because rapamycin has some toxicity associated with it. You don't want to put it in your body every single day. It's just like with aspirin. You want to take a very low dose, and that was, that's what gives you the benefits. You wouldn't want to take the kind of dose that people take to relieve chronic pain. And same with rapamycin. The proper dose, we think, is going to induce meaningful reversal of human aging. And we are helping to fund a study in Southern California where we recruit about 30 to 40 people and there's no charge whatsoever to participate in the study. It's fully funded. And we are going to give RADFEST attendees priority access. So, so if you want to enroll in the study, our Life Extension booth, anytime you want to go there, just let them know you want to be considered as a study participant, some of the criteria is on this slide as to who we want. And, and we are looking for some people that have some degenerative conditions already. We, we want to see if it can reverse those degenerative conditions. But we'll take some healthy people too so we can see the broad spectrum benefits. So here is a therapy that's available right now that may be able to extend our lifespans rather dramatically based on every single study that's been done in every single species. So we've got that technology right here and now. No new drug need to, needs to be developed. Next age reversal technology that's available right now. Boosting cellular levels of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD+. A myriad of age reversal benefits, most specifically repairing DNA. Hey, every day DNA gets damaged, it has to be repaired. NAD levels plummet when we get older. And unfortunately, when we reach age 80, our NAD levels are only about 10% of where they were when we were young. We need to boost those NAD levels. Now, there's a couple ways of doing that. If you're under age 50, you can probably accomplish that with a dietary supplement called nicotinamide riboside. It's sold by dozens of companies. Uh, it's not uh, proprietary to us or anything else. That is a precursor to NAD. So if you take the nicotinamide riboside, it will boost your levels. But if you're over 50, over 60, you may need to do more. You may need NAD plus infusions to boost your cellular NAD up to a youthful level and then maintain it with the nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside supplements. And we've got a number of people who have already gone through a clinical trial that we have funded and they are getting spectacular results without any side effects. We're always concerned about side effects, so we carefully monitor people. This is all since last year's RADFest that I'm talking about, that we're doing this kind of research on people. We don't want the animals to continue to get all the benefit. We want to start getting them too. So this is a protocol that we're working on now. We're developing a loose network of physicians who will follow the protocols that we're designing and will administer NAD plus infusions. Now, I was so convinced by the data that in April, I went through eight consecutive days. It was inconvenient. It was somewhat painful. I had some problems with it, but I knew what the benefits were. So they came into my office and hooked me up to an IV pump. And for about seven hours, it would slowly drip into my body. And my sleep patterns have improved probably about 80%. That was my main reason for doing it. Every, every person who underwent the NAD infusions reported sleeping better. That was what really impressed us. Uh, my systolic blood pressure is about 15 to 20 points lower. A number of benefits I can maybe surmise, but I'm just going to say that I was impressed with the human studies using NAD infusions to do it myself, and then we did a follow-up study to make sure that what I was doing was applicable. So this is something for everyone to consider, and again, uh, we're going to keep you informed through a new website that I'm going to describe. Now, Dr. Maharaj and others talked about hematopoietic stem cells. We only have so many of them. Once we run out, we die. Now, naysayers who don't think people can live forever could always point out in the past, well, what's going to happen when you run out of your hematopoietic stem cells? You can't live without them. Well, major breakthrough. It was reported in Scientific American just a few months ago. It's a result of actually two published studies in which, after 20 years, they've been able to grow hematopoietic stem cells in the laboratory vat and induce their production in the body. And just so everyone understands what these are, our bone marrow 
produces our immune cells, our platelets, our red blood cells. We need healthy bone marrow. But as we get older, our bone marrow unfortunately declines. And if we don't die of anything else, we will die of immune senescence because of our aged bone marrow. With this breakthrough of being able to make hematopoietic stem cells, we can cross that barrier. We, we no longer have that limitation as to how long we can live. Now this has huge ramifications for leukemia patients because they need new bone marrow when it's ablated by chemo and getting stem cell transplants is not always effective. The idea of being able to grow our own hematopoietic stem cells could give us decades of healthy lifespan. And when they tested these animals, they irradiated their bone marrow to destroy virtually all of it. And then they induced they actually took their endothelial cells and used genetic engineering to produce hematopoietic stem cells. They survived the radiation and they went on to live a normal lifespan. So this is an outrageously huge advance and as soon as it's translated into human clinical practice, we've just solved a huge problem, a huge impossible problem that's going to be rectified. So the, 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 the comments uh, from the medical community, the scientific community is that this may represent a new holy grail, not just for leukemia treatment, but also for defeating aging. Huge. And the media is picking up on it. I welcome your applause, and I've got 16 minutes to talk. So the more you applaud, the less I get to talk. But I mean, it's just the way the rules are here. But anyway, the cover of Town and Country magazine talked about, for the first time I've seen on a conventional magazine cover, that I word the immortality word. The science has finally caught the attention of the media and they issued a misleading headline implying you have to be rich in order to live forever. And some of these therapies I know are expensive right now, but they're going to get cheap and some of the therapies I'm going to talk about that you can incorporate don't cost a lot of money. Uh, the media is covering the young plasma transfer research because it is so compelling. In study after study, when young plasma is put into old animals, the old animals grow younger. And since last year's RADFest, a lot of people have gone out and bought young human plasma. And they're putting it into themselves. The anecdotal feedback is good, very promising. But that's not good enough. We need biomarkers. We need clinical measures. We need to do more research. The, a study that was uh, publicized widely was when they took the plasma from 18-year-old humans. 18-year-old human plasma was injected into old mice two times a week for three weeks. And the old mice grew biologically younger. It induced neurogenesis, new brain cells growing. Very important because our brain atrophies as we grow older. So we need new brain cells and this is a way to do it. Young plasma has systemic rejuvenating properties. The studies need to be done in order to fully validate it, especially with Dr. Mahra, what he's doing with stem cell mobilized plasma. But there are numerous other scientists that we also want to see funded who are exploring ways of using different protocols. We don't know if it's going to be once a month, once every three months, once a week. We don't know what the optimal protocol is to use young plasma to save our senior citizens, to save elderly people from dying. And what we really like about the studies, when young plasma is put into old animals, it's not just biomarkers, they're behaving younger. And I think we all want that. We don't just want to see a test result and say, oh, you're growing younger, but if you still feel old, you're not going to feel so good. But if you start behaving and running around the cage and acting younger, you know something is happening. You know you're getting some results. Before any of this, though, works, we might have to do something first. The problem is we accumulate senescent cells as we grow older. These senescent cells impede organ function because they prevent cell-to-cell -cell communication. They create systemic chronic inflammatory reactions. They can cause cancer and they shorten our lifespan. We don't want these around because we're talking about putting in young plasma. We're talking about putting in certain medications that we think will reverse aging. But removing the bad stuff may be just as important as putting in the good stuff. So this study in mice was so compelling that Credible researchers saying, researchers were saying it's time we start experimenting with people because if this works in people nearly as well as it does with mice, 
we've just resolved a huge, huge problem. And since no one else stepped forward to do it, well, we're stepping forward to do it. Within a couple of weeks, there will be a study, and it's only once a week, by the way. You take this drug once a week for three weeks, that's all the protocol is. We feel that may be sufficient to purge your body of these senile cells that linger. You want them to die. They don't die. They just stay around and cause metabolic havoc. And if you don't like the idea of dacetinab being put in your body, it is a leukemia drug, by the way. Leukemia patients take it every day. And if people are concerned about toxicity, well, those leukemia patients don't suffer severe side effects. Taking it once a week for three weeks should not be a problem. But a group in the Netherlands, they've developed a peptide that also has synolytic properties. So lots of different scientists working towards the same goal. Salk Institute, they did a study reported widely uh, at the end of 2016 where they were able to genetically modify skin cells and turn them into pluripotent stem cells. They were able to extend lifespan and progeria mice by 30% and they were able to get the mice to look younger. And for some people, that's all that matters. They want to look younger. Well, you can live longer and look younger, potentially with this therapy, a lot of positive media coverage on the idea of that Salk Institute technology reversing biological aging. We're getting the media to pick up on it. The New Yorker talking about the Silicon Valley billionaires, they don't want to die. And they are putting money into research. And that's good, we appreciate it. But we are aging. Most of us are not gonna live long enough to take advantage of their research unless we aggressively intervene into aging, which is what we are doing with the rapamycin study, the dacetinab study, the young plasma transfer studies. All those studies need to occur so we, everyone in this room, can avail ourselves to these technologies. We need to be able to take advantage of what's going on in the research laboratory. People at Harvard doing great work on DNA repair, a critical element if we're going to reverse aging. We're aging to death by the minute, and yet we know of technologies. You heard a bunch of them before I spoke, and I've just introduced a bunch more to you. We know how to reverse aging biomarkers, aging clinical measures. We know how to do it, so we as a group need to amalgamate our collective efforts, and this is the way to do it. We want to see every single one of these projects, and the other ones you talked about, uh, that we're talking about before me also, we want to see them fully funded. The idea that a scientist who has a way to make people live an extra 10 or 20 years does not receive any funding is very, very frightening to us. Now, my objective by next year's RADFEST is to be able to announce a clinical study where we will incorporate every single one of the technologies you see on your screen and hopefully a lot more. But we may start people out with dacetinab to purge their body of the senescent cells, uh, get them on the rapamycin, to purge their cells of the accumulated junk, uh, introduce young plasma constituents, GDF-11, NAD plus infusions. In other words, take an old person and revive them in a way that they can become. If they're 95, get them down to 65 or much younger. We want to see if combining all these therapies in a way that makes scientific sense can significantly reverse aging. This is our game plan. This is our game plan to attack aging today. What you heard up until now, for the most part, were great concepts that need more funding, by the way, in, in order to prove themselves out. Though the, the thymic regeneration research Greg Fahey talked about, to me, that's validated. That, that is validated, but we want to incorporate all of that into a solid program. This is our game plan. You can read about it on this website, rescueelders.org. And if you can't write it down or anything, you can, there's cards at the Life Extension booth. Uh, this is the website where we merge all of the age reversal technologies where we can let people know where is their nearest doctor who will prescribe the therapies that we recommend. We'll be able to get feedback from people undergoing these therapies. In other words, we want to know what's going on. And this website will enable us to do that. Now, Michael West, PhD. Uh, he was internationally famous, by the way, in 2001. If you don't remember, he was on all of the major networks with his breakthroughs in embryonic stem cell cloning. And he had to tell you that he almost got arrested for doing it because the federal government banned stem cell research uh, that was federally funded back in 2001. Now, in March of 2002, our magazine ran a front cover story about the atrocity that would occur by, by denying researchers access to this kind of, uh, of technology. And we had a number of our people writing Congress and complaining to the government and the president, 
but it didn't do any good. This is a battle we did not win. And one of the reasons we didn't win, I hate to say it is, people felt, oh, you have so many people reading your magazine, I didn't feel like I needed to contact my representative and two senators. I didn't feel like I needed to call the White House. And not enough people did. We lost this battle, and stem cell research was delayed by way more than eight years, by the way. I mean, they, they, they were in really good shape in 2001 to move this forward, and then the light switch was turned off. And research is not a light switch that you just turn back on. We're still suffering the impact of that ridiculous ban on stem cell research. So the point I'm making here is if we send you an email via the rescueelderly.org or via Life Extension saying, we've got an emergency here. There's a medical doctor who's got a way to reverse aging and the government's trying to stop him. Well, you need to protest. Exercise your First Amendment right and call your congressman. It does have an impact. Do this, please. This is the most frightening slide I'm going to show you tonight. This is a, came out of Nature, uh, January uh, 2015, and it uh, shows the decline in parabiosis research that occurred, probably because of lack of funding. And that concerns me greatly. If we don't get these scientists funded, if we don't participate in self-funded experimental trials, we could lose this technology for a long time. Uh, an update on what we tried to do last year, we tried to raise money for the research. We set up a company called Age Reversal Therapeutics. We needed $25 million. We took in less than a million. Uh, regrettable. We refunded 100% of the money. 100% of the money was refunded because we couldn't do the research we committed to with less than a million dollars. What we're doing now, Longevity Partnership Fund. This is a no-brainer. We're asking people to write checks, wire money, to an escrow account. The money stays in the escrow account until you want to fund a particular study. We'll email you out the study details and the business details. And if you, want, if you like that study, you can choose to fund it. If you don't like any of the studies at any time, you can get your money back. Any time. Very, very simple. Write a check to the escrow account. Let us send you emails over the next several months. If you like something, choose to fund it and we'll use that money to specifically fund that research project and for nothing else. And again, 100% of the money is refundable. Very different than other investments. We didn't have to refund that money, by the way, with age reversal therapeutics. It's an honorable thing to do. I'm just an ethical person. If I say, you give me money, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do that with your money. I'm not gonna just spend it on overhead. That's just the way I am. Um, this is how this longevity partnership operates. Again, this whole slide presentation will be available to you on the Rescue Elders website. So I know you can't read all this on the screen, but you can take your time and read it. And I do hope you'll commit to helping us fund this project where we incorporate stem cell mobilized young plasma along with all of these other therapies so that we can take a very old person and hopefully rejuvenate them in a way that they not only feel it, the biomarkers improve, the clinical measures improve, we, we literally reverse aging, and we do it in a way that we can then take advantage of all those remarkable technologies you heard earlier today. So I'm asking those who have the resources to make a tentative investment. Remember, you're writing a check, but you can get your money back anytime you want. The only time your money will be spent is if you choose to invest in a particular technology that looks promising. It's really that simple. Very, very simple. And there's a lot of people who just can't seem to part with their money. They seem to want to take it to the grave with them. I can't understand it. I really can't, because when I have money, what I think is research. Where can I put that money to live longer? But too many people are thinking like this. I only have time to talk about one billionaire this year, uh, Mr. Prebus, resident of San Diego, philanthropist. He just didn't target his money properly. Any money that you put into research should be targeted. It shouldn't be used to cover overhead. It should be used to fund a specific study. And you know the quote he made as he was dying of cancer. He was making more money than he'd ever made in his life, but money was of no use to him. Unfortunately, that is the problem. If you've got more money now than what you need to live on, please invest in something whose time has come. Human age reversal. All that's missing is the funding for some aggressive studies that we want to see happen. We want to see them happen by next year's RADFest. And please remember, we've got a track record at Life Extension at identifying therapies that are effective decades before the medical establishment recognizes them. And what I'm saying here today on behalf of Life Extension and a number of other organizations, aging is reversible. We just need the funding. 
This is the website that brings it all together. Please register. Let us know what your interests are. And we will get, send you out emails to keep you fully informed on what's going on in the age reversal field. And my time has just expired. <laughs>